it's great to, a great opportunity to uh, to have Patrick Fulton here today. He's a relatively new professor in uh, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, and uh, he did his undergraduate work um, at Georgia Tech, and then did his PhD at Penn State University, and then after that, had a couple of postdocs, one at Oregon State, and then at University of Texas. He worked for a while at uh, the University of California in Santa Cruz, and then became an assistant professor at Texas A&M before coming to Cornell a couple of years ago. And his research interests are, re are related to hydrologic and thermal processes within fault zones and how these processes either control fault slip behavior or provide in insightful signatures within faulted rocks and the use of different types of diagnostics, whether they're in boreholes or the laboratory measurements, he's highly connected to both field and laboratory work. And what I have really appreciated, uh, because we do some cross-disciplinary work, is that Professor Fulton has also become very interested in the Earth Source Heat Program and is involved a lot with the thermal hydraulic aspects, as well as reservoir characterization, subsurface characterization. And it's just great to have a have a young faculty member with a lot of a lot of intellectual horsepower and new techniques to bring into this field. And I'm sure he'll share some of that with you today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, please put your questions either in the chat box, raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll get to this at the end, okay? Great, thanks Jeff. Uh, thanks for the introduction and, and thanks everyone for um, inviting me to, um, to give a talk here um, in systems engineering. Um, so, as Jeff mentioned, I am kind of an expert. My expertise is related to fluid flow, heat transport, and geomechanics, which is essentially kind of stress and strain deformation within rocks. And so a lot of what I'm interested in relates to earthquake mechanics, but it also relates to characterization of the subsurface, uh, which has a lot of applications to uh, geothermal energy or other kind of resource development in the in the the subsurface. So all these little red dots on the map here are observatories that I work with. Um, a lot of them I, I've designed, other ones working on designing or have designed new techniques to, uh, to monitor in them. And when I'm talking about observatories, um, largely what I have developed kind of um, systems for, uh, for um, observing things in the subsurface uh, are in temperature and pressure in the subsurface, time series of pressure and temperature, and developing systems to actually analyze those in data in unique ways to get some information out of them. Um, so kind of, as Jeff mentioned, kind of the kind of big questions that I kind of am interested in is understanding the role of heat and fluids in controlling fault slip. So earthquake physics, earthquake hazard, big questions associated with those, or sometimes, uh, thermal and hydrologic processes actually tell us something about maybe about hazard, not just the physics of what's going on. They may give us some indication of what's going on, or we can use those data to tell us something about the subsurface, the subsurface hydrogeology flow networks in the subsurface that are useful for both kind of earthquake hazard stuff and kind of applied engineering type systems as well. Um, so why don't I start off with kind of Kind of my favorite observatory. This is an observatory that um, I designed um, in the Japan Trench. This is Japan, um, and this is around the location of the magnitude 9 earthquake in 2011, just 10 years ago. Um, and as earth scientists um, and earthquake physicists, a bit, this earthquake was really confounding. It was really strange. Um, it took us all by surprise. No one really expected or that a magnitude nine earthquake could, could happen here. So this plot here is kind of zoomed in on that place. The star here is the epicenter of that earthquake. And the contours here are showing how much slip occurred during that earthquake. Generally, we kind of think about earthquakes, especially down at depth. We think the epicenter where the earthquake starts may have the most amount of slip. And then as contours go out, that you would have kind of bullseye, that the amount of slip would decrease as you go further away. And then as you go shallower and shallower to the sea floor, it would die off. And maybe you don't have any kind of breakage uh, or slip at the sea floor, but maybe a little bit of undulation, which creates the tsunami. In this case, that's not what happened. At the epicenter, there was a huge amount of slip, around 30 meters of slip. 
But then that wasn't the largest amount. The shallow part of it, all the way to the sea floor, slipped 50 to 60 meters during the earthquake. The sea floor jumped half a football field across the trench here during the earthquake. The earthquake happened over the course of uh, several, a couple minutes or so. This is the most amount of earthquake that, or most amount of slip ever seen in an earthquake. And it, this upper shallow part of the subduction zone it generally doesn't slip, but in this case, it slipped the most, which meant the area that ruptured in the earthquake was much greater. So both those things contribute to a much greater magnitude of an earthquake and a much greater magnitude of a tsunami than anyone would expect. Japan is well prepared for tsunamis. They have earthquake, they have tsunami walls. Fukushima, which is down here, have a nine meter tall tsunami wall. But the tsunami was 13 meters tall because no one expected a tsunami that big. No one expected this amount of slip. So this really comes to a question about um, the forces and the physics of the earthquake itself. Why did the shallow part of the fault slip so much? Was it because it had a lot of shear strain on it? Was it loaded up with a lot of elastic energy and ready to go? Or did it just have no frictional resistance on it there and it got kicked down here and essentially just hydroplaned? Kind of two competing models for, for this. This all kind of relates to a question that is in earthquake physics and, and that's essentially how much shear stress or frictional resistance, how much breaks are on faults during an earthquake or an earthquake slip. Seismologists and, and that look at the squiggles on seismometers, they can do a lot of stuff with those signals. They could tell us how much the stress changed in an earthquake, but they can't tell us the absolute magnitude of the stresses or the forces acting on an earthquake. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about stress here for at least for this part here. Um, and so here's a little subduction zone. We've got a fault or one plate, the Pacific plate going down underneath kind of Japan, uh, the overlying plate here. We're talking about stresses and, and why we do this is relates to kind of, uh, you know, Newton's second law, you know, the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. If we wanna tell, describe a system of how it moves, we need to know something about the force balance on the case. So here we talk about stresses instead of forces, it's just force per unit area. And we've got two different things that are acting or kind of two different components uh, of stress. Stress is a full tensor, but what we're interested on in a particular fault plane is the normal stress, the part that is holding the fault together, largely controlled by the weight of the rocks, density and the weight of the rocks and gravity and the angle of the fault. And then we have the shear stress, and this is the shear, the amount of, of um, uh, that is trying to make it slide along that plane. Very simple. Now, actually, as earth scientists, we actually think about rocks that have pores in them and, and saws that have pores. So if you zoom in on a microscopic level, you can think about the force balance a little bit even more detailed. You, can, you have to kind of consider the, the pressure of the fluids that are inside. The fluid pressure is exerting a pressure in, kind of in all directions, and that reduces the, the effect of what the whole system is actually feeling, and we call that the effect of normal stress, which is just the normal stress minus the fluid pressure. Now, we often call and refer to something called friction or the frictional strength, and that the, you know, you have a certain effect of normal stress, you have some shear stress. What is the shear stress it takes to actually break this rock? Um, uh, and that's related to kind of the strength of the rock. Um, but this relationship between the shear stress and perhaps the shear stress that it takes to actually cause the, the fault to, to move relative to the effect of normal stress, that ratio we call the friction coefficient. Um, and so we can actually measure this in the lab. We can take some rocks, we can put them under different fluid pressure conditions, and we could take all different types of rock types like sandstones and limestones, um, all different things that you could see just walking through the gorge. You put it in the lab, you put it under pressure, different normal stresses, and you measure the shear stress it takes to actually break that rock or cause uh, maybe a, a, a planar surface uh, cut between that uh, within that rock, causing it to actually slip and fail. And this slope here, that shear stress to affect normal stress, is the friction coefficient. 
And surprisingly, you know, Jim Byerly at the USGS did this in the 1970s on lots of different rocks. And what's interesting is that for most rocks, once you're down at pressures that are, that are deep underground, the friction coefficient is relatively the same for all different types of rocks, or at least most type of rocks. There are a few, a few kind of uh, things that are outliers like talc or something. Um, but generally, friction is generally around 0.6 to 0.8, this friction coefficient. Well, that's quite interesting. Some people call this Byerly's law. It's not a law, it's just an empirical relationship. But then the question is, well, how much frictional resistance do faults have during real earthquakes? And so this is just kind of putting it under pressure and kind of seeing how much it just starts to slip. Interestingly, in the past 10, 15 years, we've been actually able to kind of simulate earthquakes at earthquake sip speeds in the lab. And essentially what we do is, well, colleagues of mine do is they will take some rocks, two rocks together, and they will push them together at, with a vise. And then they will spin them kind of with like a motorcycle engine. And they'll spin them at high speed under high amounts of, uh, of normal stress. And they can figure out how much uh, shear resistance there was while it was slipping. And so here is a, a plot of the friction coefficient um, at different slip rates on a logarithmic scale here. So at very slow slip rates, we get something just like Byerly was saying, 0.6 to 0.8. But at high speed slip rates, once we go up to something maybe around a meter per second, similar to what we see in an earthquake, we get a whole range of values. Some things from you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, all the way down to next to zero here, whole range. So what's going on? And um, what's going on in a real system? So we don't, we need, are very curious to know what's happening in a, a real system because we want to know um, what are the forces acting on a fault. Um, uh, and we also want to know if an earthquake had a certain amount of stress drop that we can resolve from size, seismometers and seismology, we want to know, is that fault still loaded? Is it still got a lot of elastic energy or is it all good and, and, and relieve that stress for a while? We don't need to worry as much. So here's one of those experiments because it gives us an insight into maybe how we could do this without seismology. So I'm not sure if you could hear the, the, the video or the, the audio to that. He was not saying faster, faster, faster. He was essentially saying in Italian, enough, enough. Um, so as we were shearing or as this sample, this rock was being sheared, it created so much frictional heat that it actually melted the rock pretty well. But that's actually the key to how we might be able to figure out the, fr the frictional resistance on a fault after an earthquake or during an earthquake is that the amount of heat that is generated during earthquake or the amount of heat per unit area is the direct product of the average shear stress times the amount of displacement. So if we can perhaps measure how much heat was generated during the earthquake, and we know from seismology and from other measures how much slip there was, we could perhaps back out what the average shear resistance was during the earthquake. Now, the problem is with that, it sounds like a crazy idea, is that we have to go down into the fault to catch, catch that temperature to be able to measure it. All that heat is down deep underground. The other problem is, is just like when you put your hot pocket in the microwave and it's like liquid molten magma, uh, when you put it in there for too long, but you forget about it all day and you go and get it later on, it's you know cold and disgusting or more disgusting than usual. It's lukewarm uh, temperature. This heat can get up to a thousand degrees in the fault during an earthquake, but it is quickly diffusing into the surroundings. So the idea would be that we would have to, if we were going to measure this heat, we would have to get down into the fault at great depths um, and we'd have to get there quickly before it diffused away. And so this is a crazy idea. This is an idea that um, I worked with colleagues on as a postdoc and as a grad student, as a kind of a side project 
kind of thinking of all the te technical challenges that might be associated with this. But after this earthquake with 50 meters of slip, the shear stress times displacement, here the displacement was very huge. So maybe we could perhaps get a much bigger signal um, than we would expect otherwise. Um, and there was slip at very shallow depth uh, in this earthquake. And so perhaps we could go and measure it here, um, but we would have to get there very quickly. And I think working with my colleagues uh, uh, across the globe and especially in Japan, um, we all kind of recognized that this is a huge earthquake and we wanted to try to figure out as much and do as much kind of scientific good from it um, uh, to better understand earthquakes um, as we could in this kind of great disaster. So the idea here was that perhaps we could drill into the fault roughly 850 meters below the seafloor and essentially perhaps measure the temperature across the fault after the earthquake. But we'd have to get there soon, within maybe a year or two. We were actually able to do this with the deep sea drilling vessel Chikyu in the Integrated Ocean Discovery Program, kind of an inter international kind of consortium um, or program um, partially sponsored by the National Science Foundation. So we were able to do this and put this all together within one year after the earthquake. And so there's a lot of technical challenges associated with this project because one of the things too with this is that if we could try to get the fault maybe within a kilometer of drilling underneath the seafloor, the other challenge here is on this axis here. This axis is the depth. So this green stuff is the downgoing plate, the oceanic Pacific plate. And the overlying kind of plate of that Japan is sitting on is all this gray stuff up here. Um, on this axis here is the depth of the sea um, below sea level. The seafloor is at a water depth of 7,000 meters. That is the greatest drilling depth that has ever been ever done. There is, well, there's been a couple of very, very shallow holes a couple meters deep in the Marianas Trench. But in this case, this is the deepest water depth of any big, any substantial hole. And not only do we want to have a very long hole in here, we want to install an observatory to measure the temperature across the hole. And so to measure the, the, the temperature across the fault here, we can't just kind of go and drill the hole and just run a log or something. We're gonna disturb the thing, the, the temperatures by kind of drilling the hole. Um, we're gonna to have to design a system that can sit there and re-equilibrate. And we can't go like after work or something with this ship to kind of go down here. This is pretty remote and at the bottom of the seafloor. We're gonna to need to have some system that can sit there and measure temperature, measure it to high resolution and high accuracy. And so to do that, I designed a system that is, um, uh, has a, bun a lot of redundancy and it's also very simple. Also for many reasons, but one of the reasons because we had to kind of get this all together within one year uh, of the earthquake. And so this is essentially what the observatory looks like. It's the, we, in the, the Brown here, we drill a hole across the fault. The fault is around 818 meters below seafloor. We drill the fault down to 850 meters. And then inside of this well, this hole, we install a long thin tube of uh, three and a half inch diameter, inner diameter. And inside of that tube, we have a, a line as the marine technicians will call them, or it's essentially a static climbing rope. And attached to that, I have all of these temperature sensors. And each of these temperature sensors here are, have their own data logger. And the temperature sensors are, are remarkable in that they have an accuracy of a thousandth of a degree Celsius. And they have a, actually a resolution to uh, I don't know, 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth degrees Celsius, um, but accuracy to a thousandth of a degree Celsius. Um, and they all have their own data logger. So if one kind of um, uh, fritz out, we have redundancy here. And so we've attached them on this rope at close spacing, especially near the fault zone at about a meter and a half apart from each other. So we could perhaps measure the temperature at different things, maybe see if we see anomalous temperature um, near the fault zone. They're all encased in titanium to deal with the extreme pressures uh, down at essentially eight kilometers underneath 
of water um, sitting up above you. So we wrap them up in, in rubber. We've got them attached to the thing. Here's another little thing that we designed in the system. We call it a weak link. There was some suggestion that even after 50 meters of slip that the fault might still be moving as much as maybe a, a millimeter per day. If we're gonna leave our sensors down there to re-equilibrate and then perhaps see something for, for several months, um, could mean that the fault slips and shears our pipe and grabs hold of our sensors. So this thing is designed to fail um, in case, so in case it grabs hold of something, it's that has a different, we have a few of them with different strengths on it so that depending upon where it may get caught, we may be able to get the sensors back that are uh, remaining above it. Um, we have a big heavy weight on the bottom and we hope to see it again. And so we wrote some letters on that. Um, and then this is what the wellhead is going to look like on the seafloor. So this is kind of, there's a little ring here and all our string with all our temperature sensors, like uh, essentially 800 meters of them are all hanging below the ship right now. And this is on the ship, uh, on the, the drill rigs, um, rig floor. And now we're gonna have to connect this and then bring it down to the seafloor and enter into the hole again, which is a very technically challenging thing. And um, uh, I don't think we have time to, to discuss today, but we connect it to drill pipe and slowly lower it down to the seafloor. And luckily we were able to find the hole on the seafloor again, re-enter it. And then this little kind of, uh, uh, that kind of bright spot there, that's the ring that perhaps we will want to come back um, and grab with an, a remotely operated vehicle later on to pull all of our sensors back out to collect the data. So we installed that on, uh, uh, I guess I missed the time. Oh, I guess there it is, yeah. On July 16th, 2012, uh, the earthquake happened March 11th, 2011, 15 months afterwards. We designed this thing, built it, and got it into the ground. Um, we left it there for roughly nine months. Um, 10 months and um, we came back and this is the ROV Keiko, Keiko 7002 uh, ROV. Uh, it's called the 7000 uh, because 7000 meters is the maximum water depth that this ROV uh, can operate. Very few, few ROVs can go to, to those depths. Um, and this is the maximum operating depth what's just near our, um, our kind of operations. Uh, or where our borehole is. And then it's called the two because the first Keiko imploded or was lost. And so they didn't want to push it too much. And so that's why we we're uh, a bit cautious and why we kind of chose the site that we did. Um, this is what it looked like uh, on the seafloor. And this is the ROV's arms. And here we, we grabbed hold of it and we pulled the sensors back up to the seafloor. We were able to recover all of them. So this now is a, a plot of what the data look like. And this is where we get into some fun stuff. Um, so here um, I've removed the background geotherm. Geotherm means kind of um, how temperature generally increases with depth, somewhat linearly, but we remove that kind of background increase in temperature from our signals to see the anomalous signals. Um, and so when we do that, we call it residual temperature. And I've got that plotted as color here as a function of depth below the seafloor and as a function of time. So at first you could see all this blue stuff here. Why is it, why is it blue? It means it's colder than we would expect. And that's reasonable because we would expect this because when we drill the hole, we're circulating lots of ocean water, trying to get all the broken up rocks out of the system. And, um, and so that's the drilling disturbance. That's why we had to have our sensors sit there for a while to re-equilibrate. Then there's some other things going on here, some little bits of flow, which we'll get to, or, or changes uh, above zero, um, which we think are related to fluid advection, fluid flow going through fractures and such. Um, but then there's this other big kind of anomalous temperature. And I'll talk about the advection a little bit. But down here, anomalously warm, hot stuff down at around 820 meters below seafloor. The plate boundary fault from coring and logging and other analysis we, um, we uh, suspect is at 818 meters below seafloor. 
This down here is what we infer to be the frictional heat signal from the earthquake. So maybe it got up to a thousand degrees during, during the earthquake. A year later, what we see is something on the order of about 0.3 degrees Celsius. I didn't tell you about the geotherm. On the seafloor, the temperature on the seafloor is around three degrees Celsius. And down here at around 820 meters below seafloor, it's around 25 degrees C. I used to say that that's kind of room temperature, but I live in Ithaca now and I'm very kind of chilly today. So it's definitely not 25 C. Um, so let's look at this kind of frictional heat signature as well. There's also another little thing here at this kind of dashed line. While we were monitoring in the system, there was an aftershock, a magnitude 7.3 earthquake, not on this fault, but deeper down in the downgoing plate pretty much directly beneath our site here, magnitude 7.3 earthquake. We can actually see how maybe fluid flow is coming out of a fracture here and it changed after that earthquake and now fluid flow is in colonizing infection coming out of this one. But to kind of ignore or kind of to um, not complicate things, we're gonna just focus down where the frictional heat signature is at that time before that kind of big earthquake. And so this is the data kind of zoomed in here. Um, and we're gonna now kind of create models now for trying to explain this data. And there's kind of three processes that are affecting this data. One is the circulation of all that um, drilling fluid, which was just water, ocean water to get all those chips in, all that cold water. We know how much cold water we were circulating, so we know that. The other thing that is affecting the temperature is just the installation of the cold steel pipe with all our sensors in it. But we know the thermal properties of that. We actually know the thermal properties of the rock itself. I painstakingly did hundreds of measurements on core samples from, from this region. So we know those things as well. The one parameter that we don't, that is affecting us, that we don't have is how much heat energy was deposited on the fault during the earthquake. And that's what we can essentially play as with a free parameter and do an inversion for. Um, and this is our best fit model here that kind of solves for how much heat energy um, was deposited on the fault that can explain this, this kind of signature uh, allowing for diffusion over time and the recovery of the drilling disturbance and other things. And what we get is 27 megajoules per meter squared which may not mean anything. Maybe it means more to you than it does to me. Um, uh, but this is the, the amount of work done by friction uh, on this patch of, of fault during the earthquake. We said that energy is, or energy per unit area is related to the average shear stress times displacement. And so if we divide by the 50 meters of displacement, we can actually get the average shear stress, which is half a megapascal. And that might too, that might depend upon where you are at depth. Um, so we can also know based on kind of the weight of the rocks or the density of the rocks, something about maybe the dense, uh, the, um, the normal stress. And so we can actually divide by that and actually get the co-seismic friction coefficient. And what we get is 0 0.08. Now, Byerly and Byerly's law was 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Here, we're getting a value that is an order of magnitude less. So this can answer the question, was the fault, did it slip 50 meters because it was really strong, had a lot of friction and was able to build up a lot of elastic strain energy? Probably not. What this is suggesting is that it, the fault had no breaks. The, the frictional resistance on the fault was very, very low. The average friction coefficient during slip was almost zero. This is kind of like hydroplaning, so that the fault started down at depth, the rupture was continuing on, and the brakes went off, and it just continued to slip and go um, unstable. So this is a kind of a big kind of result that is kind of influencing a lot of kind of hazard models and, and our understanding of kind of the physics of how earthquakes happen, uh, our, our kind of understanding and kind of leading guiding questions about whether other subduction zones have this potential to have very low friction coefficient in the shallow part, perhaps much bigger tsunamis than, than we would expect. So now I want to talk, we're going to come back to this data here, but I want to talk about another kind of um, issue that is related both to earthquake physics, 
and to kind of reservoir modeling type of analysis. In both systems, we are very curious to know or want to know where, what is the subsurface permeability structure? Where are the permeable structures? One of the ways that, that, um, that fluids can actually influence earthquakes and fault set behavior is in that effective stress. The fluid pressure can weaken rocks, reduce the amount of shear stress that is required for a fault um, to slip. That's kind of maybe obvious to you in the, when you think about hydraulic fractures or hydrofracking, where you increase the fluid pressure so much until you actually cause the, 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 the rocks to break. That happens can happen naturally as well if you have fractures that are transmitting fluids Maybe the fracture opens up in response to an earthquake. It transmits high pressure fluids from one depth to a different depth. And um, it can perhaps drive uh, a fault to, to, to failure, to slip uh, in that case. We want to know about those processes um, in terms of earthquakes. Similarly, um, and this is um, uh, you know, Jeff Tester and, and others, including myself involved with Earth's source heat and geothermal systems, we're very much interested to know where are the permeable fractures that could allow us to have good connectivity fluid flow between two different well sets. If you were trying to, uh, to drill a well in your backyard, you want to know where are the, especially here in Ithaca, where are the permeable fractures? Um, what is the permeability of those systems? So this is where my group has actually done a lot of interesting work um, in kind of advancing this. So generally, if you want to know the hydrology or the permeability of the subsurface, hydrologists, myself included, um, will often take a well and we will perhaps screen off one section that is exposed to the subsurface. And then we might pump a lot of water out or pump a lot of water into the system, change the kind of pressure in that system and then see how it diffuses or how it recovers over time. And then we might get the, the hydrologic properties of those things. But essentially, we're going to get an average, one value for that well, and we're get, it's going to be an average for uh, or kind of an estimate for that whole kind of screened interval or for the whole well. It's not going to tell you exactly where those different um, positions are. Um, and it's going to give you a single value. So now um, the other way that this is done, especially in fault zones, is people might look at coarse samples if they want to figure out something about the structure, uh, especially around faults and fractures of what the permeability and porosity um, is, is that they will take coarse samples, small camera samples, and do it in the lab. However, these type of things are not very realistic um, or applicable to large-scale reservoir modeling because there is a much different, a big difference between what you're measuring in the lab that might be a perfectly uh, perfect rock with no fractures and the real system that has lots of fractures that are not being represented when you bring it into the lab. So we really want to have uh, some way to characterize the subsurface hydrogeology essentially. And that comes back to this data that we have here. And especially this blue stuff, all that drilling disturbance, you know, all this stuff that is disturbance, noise, stuff to ignore, Generally, this is where, this is my bread and butter. I like to dive into these kind of noise aspects and try to figure out what we can use that information for um, um, or get from that, from that. And so you'll see here that the vari that there is kind of some variations with the drilling disturbance at depth. This one is taking a much longer time to recover. And why, why do we think that, um, so we can actually map that and we can actually kind of figure out what the permeability or the recovery time is, the characteristic recovery time at different depths is. And clearly it's different at different depths. If we did a very kind of simple conductive model of circulating flow in a pipe or in a borehole and the borehole was, the walls were impermeable, we'd expect something about 20 days to recover. However, if you've got permeable fractures and you allow some of those fluids to infiltrate into them, you've now cooled off a much wider zone around your borehole wall because the fluids were, were able to access those permeable spots. And now those areas are now gonna take a lot longer to recover. And so we use now this recovery time 
as a proxy for the permeability structure. We suspect um, that, that these bigger spots here, this spike here, and the, the, these zones with longer recovery times correspond with more permeable zones. And that actually lines up with logging data and, and core analysis where we generally see that the plate boundary fault down here is very clay rich and very dense and impermeable. But up above it, our abund is a damage zone, a bunch of broken rocks and faults and fractures that are open. Perhaps in this zone, we actually have fluids actually flowing through them a little bit. In these zones that correspond with, with our per, more permeable zones. So this is kind of a qualitative assessment of of permeability structure. I have a student, Ivan Puramaska, who is, um, for his master's, has developed models of this system um, and at, can actually, uh, is in the process of, of the, being able to actually invert and actually get permeability or transmissivity structure off of, off of, um, off the recovery time if we know something about the drilling operations, the circulation time. It's pretty interesting. Oh, here are some of his models, but I don't think we have time for that. So the other thing here uh, that we can get and that I haven't talked about, we talked about frictional heat, the drilling disturbance, now this advection. We suspect that there may be fluid flow that's going through a known fracture here around 783. And then that big magnitude 7.3 earthquake, we call it a doublet because there was actually kind of two earthquakes at the same time. Um, uh, and it seemed to kind of shake things up, close kind of this pathway off, and now the fluid is coming out of this one here. So if we actually look at those different things, there's often a question, how do we know this frictional heat signature isn't caused by advection? Well, there's a number of reasons. One, low recovery time suggests it's low permeability. The core itself tells us low that it's low, um, low permeability, probably not affected by advection. The other thing is if we just look at the, the kind of the curves themselves, again, now we're looking again at residual temperature. We've removed the background geotherm. At 820, where the plate boundary fault is, it's very smooth. It just follows kind of a pure kind of diffusion curve. There's a little bit of a, a you know, a perturbation due to that earthquake, probably some shaking of water in the system. And then it continues on very smooth. Now these other ones where we suspected that there was advection going on, we see all this high frequency noise, especially at the times when we think that there is advection going on. So this got me thinking, what is going on with all that high frequency noise? So what I did, what I'll show you in this next plot, is I just did a high pass filter on this data. So I'm just gonna look at the noise, the noise levels at these different things and I'll plot it up. Oh, I forgot. We can actually get some things about the flow rates off of that, but we'll, mo we'll move on. So now we've got this, a similar plot that we had before, but now instead of plotting just temperature, residual temperature, we're plotting the high pass filter data. And so the color is essentially the, places that are a little bit higher or lower relative to zero in this high pass filter data. And then just to kind of show you what the data look like, I've just superimposed one of the log, like each one of the sensors logs of temperature on each spot. So you could see perhaps here at 775, there's just a little bit of noise. Da, 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 da. Then that magnitude December, magnitude 7.3 earthquake happens and it goes up, it heats up a little bit and then kind of goes back down, kind of falls a thing. Now you'll also see that there's some pretty clear correlated signals here. Um, and you'll see a few little, you know, clearly there's a lot of stuff going on associated with that earthquake. Um, but you'll see some other spots here, like over here, hopefully you can see my cursor. You'll see around maybe 785, you'll see that there's a little bump up in the temperature. And the one below it goes up above it. And then at 792, it looks a little flat, but then down below 792 at 795, it's going down and all these are going down at the same time. And then there's some other ones that seem kind of correlated over here and some other ones over here. So what is going on? This took me some time to think about and wrap my head around, but I think I figured it out. Now, what I think is going on is that this is a signal, whenever we're seeing signals here, this is down deep underground, um, you know, half a mile underground in a very small diameter borehole, uh, not much is going on. If we see perturbations, 
it's probably not frictional heat or anything happening for uh, these kind of short high frequency things. These high frequency things are related to advection, fluid advection. So why do some go up and some go down? What I think is happening, we know there's actually a mapped fracture zone right here at 792. And we think that fluid is coming out of that fracture and then it's going up and down the borehole walls. And when water comes out and it's at some temperature and it goes up to shallower depths, because temperature increases with depth, when that water comes up and goes to shallower depth, it's gonna be warmer than the surroundings. When it goes down to deeper depths, it's gonna be colder than the surroundings. And that's what we see in these things here. We think that these are little fluid flow events of flow coming out of these fractures. We could see them at a lot of different places. And so, you know, I can change the gain on these things to try to identify them better or, or worse and stuff. But instead, I stole a little trick um, from seismologists. And what I did was I look over here and I see all this little noise on this sensor. And if they're totally unrelated, um, these sensors are, they have their own data loggers. They should be totally uncorrelated in terms of noise with the other ones. And so what we did was we just kind of compared the correlation between the noise between different sensors or the nearest sensor and just kind of mapped where the correlation, what the correlation function was. How similar is it to the background? If it's just sitting there, nothing, no connection to the other ones, they should be uncorrelated. But if there's fluid evection, we can measure to a thousandth of a degree. So the smallest little fluid movement or advection we could see, and then that fluid advection could affect multiple sensors at the same time. I forgot to point out that these little arrows, these times where we see these things, correspond to the times of other earthquakes that are going on in the region. So, and here are some plots, kind of other ways of kind of showing these different signals of shallower depths rising up, smaller ones going down, uh, deeper ones going down. These events kind of last about a half a day. So it's not just the shaking in the course of a few seconds during an earthquake. These are essentially squirts of water. An earthquake happens and it flows out for a half a day. I won't make that sound for a half a day, but um, uh, you, uh, so these are kind of prolonged events, um, transient pulses of vertical fluid advection. Um, so we do that high pass filter, the correlation coefficient, and we map the correlation coefficient. And so this is essentially telling us where in depth and when in time there is fluid evection affecting these, these signals. And you could see they are pulse-like. They are occurring as squirts that are la each lasting about a half a day. And these each kind of correspond to, to um, an earthquake. And then the other cool thing is that most of them seem to be kind of up and uh, above and below. The evection is occurring centered around this known fault location. Down at the plate boundary fault, we don't see any of that, kind of giving us additional evidence that there's not much evection going on in the plate boundary fault. Our frictional experiments are probably good. Um, so we've done a bunch of things looking at, at this. We can actually kind of compare it to other earthquakes in the site in the region. So here we're saying whether we saw a fluid pulse, we saw 23 of them. And there's not a very good correlation with only the close ones occurred or the magnitude depended uh, on it a little bit. Instead, when we look as a function of time, we see that once there is a big one, it clearly opens things up and we see lots of other ones, even ones that are affected by small amounts of ground shaking. This is the pressure spike that we see on a, on a, a seafloor instrument that is measuring, uh, the, uh, measuring pressure. So this is kind of a measure of the ground shaking at this zone. So we see that it becomes very sensitive after a big event, but then other big events are occurring and we don't see any kind of fluid pulse until later on, maybe another one big happens again and then becomes sensitive again, and then it changes. A changing kind of sensitivity to this. And so this is kind of similar to something we've seen before. We call this a damage and healing process where perhaps the fracture or the, is kind of being opened up and allowing fluids to come through or maybe allowing pulses of fluid to come through. But over time, after it's kind of gotten shaken up and damaged, it's rehealing. The permeability uh, is, is, is sealing up again. Perhaps the aperture is changing until it gets kind of shaken up again. Um, 
And this now relates to some observations, a different type of kind of study. This is a lot of the stuff we've been doing on, on, on temperature. We're using kind of machine learning to identify these things, not just with correlation, but just in a single sensor, identify um, transient flow events at micro scale flow events. Um, um, but the other thing where we've seen this damage in hearing process um, is in a number of places, but most famously in, in China after the magnitude 8.3 Wenchuan earthquake in May 2008. This is a, a, um, a colleague of mine, um, Leanne uh, Xu. Uh, she was a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz when I was a research scientist there. And, and we both kind of got involved in this project of drilling boreholes across the fault there after that earthquake on the edge of the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and so here she is with a, a panda. Um, and um, one of the things is we, we did a lot of temperature work, but I want to focus on kind of an additional kind of measurement that we got. And I'll tell you how we got it in a moment, but we measured permeability over time. I told you that generally with well tests, you get one measurement for the well and you get it once and that's it. Here we actually have permeability measurements as a function of time in this well. So this well goes down maybe uh, 1,200 meters down, the fault is around a kilometer depth. Um, and so we're measuring inside the fault zone the permeability, the permeability of the fault zone. And we see, this is a little confounding, that the permeability as a function of time has these big jumps, and then these slow decays, and then another big jump and a slow decay. It was confounding until we got our hands on like a local earthquake catalog. And what we found was that these jumps correspond with the time of earthquakes. The earthquakes in the region are not really affecting this fault or not slipping on this fault here. They're on other places, but they're shaking the system up, opening up the poor throats, probably unclogging poor throats and allowing the flow and allowing permeability, to, um, allowing the, the faults and the fractures to be more permeable. But then over time, as flow goes through them, they are getting clogged up, either resealing by precipitation or just clay particles getting clogged in them. So this is kind of another example of this permeability uh, measurement. Now, how do we do this? How do we get permeability over time? Do we have to do a pump test or a slug test every day or something, one of these uh, tests? No, we're, it, was, it was exciting to spend my New Year's in a little hut up in the mountains in the Tibetan Plateau to do a lot of these measurements. But we're a little bit, um, we prefer to do, I didn't want to spend years out there. So we use, we've been kind of using this other technique um, and kind of advancing it a bit to use, to passively monitor perturbations to wells. And we're measuring the response to earth tides. So just as the sun and the moon pull on the oceans, they're actually pulling and straining the rocks as well. And those small amounts of strains actually create um, uh, pressure changes in the formation. And we see them, let's see if I got it in the well here, with high resolution or, or, or very sensitive pressure sensors that are continuously monitoring in these wells, we can actually see you know, a few centimeters of change in water level that are following kind of a tidal period in these wells. Now, the weird thing is, is that we can use gravimeters to actually know what the strain of the earth is, or we can use tidal models. The thing is, is that the timing of when these water level changes are showing these tidal signals they don't line up with when we know the tides are really occurring, when the strain is occurring. A little confounding, but actually that is useful information. Again, this is you know the noise or something, the, the, the problem with your data. The problem with the data not lining up with the, the tides actually tells us something about the elastic and, and, and um, uh, hydrologic properties. Now, why there's a time, or time lag is that you squish the rocks here, the pressure goes up in the formation. It takes some time based on the permeability, the transitivity of the rocks to actually flow into the well and to go up and down. And the amplitude there actually um, is largely controlled by the elastic properties of the rocks. We, we call it storativity in, in, in hydrology. And so these are kind of based on kind of different aquifer models, kind of plots of permeability versus elastic property here. And this is essentially the phase lag, which is being plotted up on these things. So essentially we can see the amplitude response. We could see the, the time delay in the strains and we can actually invert for hydrologic properties by just kind of sitting out there or, or letting our sensors record 
these earth tides. Um, so we did that in China. Leanne and I also just down the road from, from Santa Cruz, uh, the San Andreas Fault goes through. It's got a, a big uh, mine here because it's a damage zone. So the fault has already broken up the rocks. And, um, and so uh, there's a quarry here. And so there's a few very small diameter, two inch diameter monitoring wells around here. And so we asked permission to, to put some um, sensors in them. And we did this and we did this analysis. We can look at the tides and do our tidal analysis, get the amplitudes and phases. We can actually invert for the permeability specific storage, the elastic constants for these different wells. And we see the permeability near the fault is a little bit higher than away from the fault. The specific storage elastic properties are a little bit different. But interesting, the diffusivity is fairly constant between the two things. There may be some trade-off between the two, between the two different parts. Um, so that's something we've done. A student of mine, Jake Simon, has actually done this now for other data a series of 23 boreholes all across the, the Western United States kind of does, um, uh, and can actually, uh, that are kind of along uh, plate boundary faults here and can actually figure out diffusivity, specific storage permeability for all these things and their time variations as well. So in this kind of passive monitoring thing, uh, lots of information data mining off of that. Now I talked about how, um, I want to kind of get to this part here a little bit. We talk about how water level may be affected by the strain, the earth tides, but they're also affected by the strain of earthquakes or fault slip. So this is a model, poor elastic model of how, um, how pressure, fluid pressure would change, or you could think of it a little bit of kind of like volumetric strain due to a slip on a fault down at this depth. If you're in front of the slip, your, your rocks are gonna be squished like SpongeBob and you're gonna have an increase in pressure. If you're away from the fault and the fault is slipping away from you, you get dilation and the pressure goes down. And now, so this is really interesting for earthquakes, people have known about this for a while. But the other thing where this comes about and where another direction of my work is, is related to these things called slow earthquakes. These slow slip events motion on the faults, sometimes precursory slip on faults before big earthquakes um, uh, that are now kind of ob observed. And so this was kind of discovered in the past 15 years by looking at GPS sensors. GPS sensors that are just measuring the same position, they're kind of plugged in to the same spot and they just record, where am I, where am I, where am I? It sounds pretty boring, but over time, on geologic scales, where you can actually see maybe the easting displacement. You could see that it's slowly moving to the east. And that's because in Cascadia, there's a subduction zone. The oceanic plate is being pushed underneath North America, but it's kind of locked right now. And it's kind of stuck and it's moving and it's pushing Seattle to the east. But then every once in a while, we would see, well, Rogers and Draggart, these scientists from, from Canada would see these kind of movement of a few centi few millimeters back to the west. And that's what happens when there is an earthquake. But instead of happening at, over the course of a few seconds, they saw this over the course of days to weeks. And so they're like, is this something screwy with our instruments or kind of processing? Who knows? Similarly, in Japan, after a big earthquake in 1995, the Japanese government invested uh, nearly a billion dollars to install a seismic network of in the, where the seismometers were buried in deep boreholes so that you could get rid of a lot of the surface noise and stuff. So high resolution, the best quality sensors that you could get and deep in boreholes to get the best kind of signal to noise going on. However, you know, kind of the head of the system was looking out, it's on the screen and he was like, I see all this noise on my instrument, like a dump truck is going by. Uh, my sensor. And then he saw it on other ones too. It was correlated. It was like a dump truck was going past all, all of Ithaca at the same time. And it wasn't, these weren't earthquakes or you couldn't see a P and S wave on these. This was just kind of background rumbling and noise. This was because it was correlated, we called this tremor and later was identified to happen on the, the, the plate boundary. So we call these episodic tremor and slip things. These correspond later were determined to happen at the same time. Two indications that the fault is slipping. Little parts of it are starting to go. We're having kind of failure in the system 
before or perhaps uh, perhaps could trigger a big earthquake. Sometimes they do, many times they do not. But it's something that we want to know about what is going on. Unfortunately, where most of the stuff is happening in terms of slip is all offshore. Big subduction zones that have magnitude eight and nine earthquakes, most of the plate that is locked and ready to go is all underwater. So we can't put GPS sensors out there. It's really hard to know anything about what's going on. So that's a big challenge. Um, but that's where observatories come into play as well. So here's an observatory from a borehole in Costa Rica where, where you've kind of got a, like a well where we've got like a tube, a screen section at the bottom where we measure fluid pressure. We've got a straw up at, to here where we've got a pressure sensor and we can measure the pressure. And so we're measuring kind of fluid pressure in the fault zone here. And we could see that once we get rid of the tides and stuff, that we would see these step changes that we might be kind of corresponding to maybe slip a slow silent slip on the fault. We could also measure kind of the flow rate coming through this through some kind of ingenious flow rate detectors on here that also can allow us to get us um, geochemical sampling. Um, so now not just having one borehole, having two boreholes across the fault zone, this is in Southwest Japan, similar system, taking out the, the tidal effects and things like that, you're measuring kind of the fluid formation pressure. You can see this one is going down at the same time as one, the other one is going up. And what we think is going on is that slip is occurring, very slow slip over the course of several weeks. Slip is occurring, it's you know down below this one, so it's kind of pushing this one, causing this one to, to, um, to go up, but it's, the slip is moving away from this one, and so the, the pressure is going down. On this one, it's going down. The slip is going away from that fault. This one is going towards it, and then it probably went past it, and now it's going back down. And we see that these things kind of often occur at the same time as some of these tremors that we are seeing on the seafloor. But oftentimes, we can see them many weeks, days before, or hours to days before we see them otherwise. Um, so Patrick, and, we're kind yeah. of at the end of the hour here. And just to give you a chance so maybe people could ask questions at some point, I don't know how close you are to, to finishing. Yeah, I, I forgot the time here. So why don't right. I just kind of say that, um, that we're doing these things in different places, including in New Zealand, where we just installed other things and just got some new data back. Um, but the other thing is now kind of applying this to, to what we want to right. do here in a borehole um, related to the earth source heat project. And so um, we want to kind of design a system. We have funding to drill a three kilometer deep borehole here on campus to measure things like permeability structure, temperature, variability, flow, hydrology, and stuff to kind of prepare us for, for developing a geothermal system here. Um, and so in that, we're going to have sensors, especially fiber optic sensing capabilities to measure temperature and strain and things like that within the system. Um, and maybe I'll just leave it there. Thank you. So that was actually what I was going to ask you to, to, to elaborate on anyways, was sort of the connection to, you know, Cornell's interest in the living lab and uh, how can we go about sort of de-risking the whole operation. But I think one thing that I saw that was kind of interesting uh, was that you know, we're, we're using this as an ops observatory and something to characterize things before we do anything, but it's, its value could be quite good after we try to change things in the earth. Uh, and so maybe you could comment on that a little bit because, you know, it's not just permeability, it's also induced seismicity, you know, are we using it for imaging in some way, which I think could be really powerful too. Yeah, so certainly. So one, we, we could use a lot of these techniques and using kind of, especially in temperature, we can, um, uh, both passive and active uh, measurements, we can, you know, perturbations, um, we can perhaps help kind of constrain where the permeable zones are and such. And permeability and connectivity and things like that, that are really important for designing a system that would be operational. But the other thing, especially in the earthquake physics, realm associated with, associated with induced seismicity are questions related to kind of how fluid pressure and temperature kind of relate to the deformation and per, 
particularly across different types of rock units. And so we hope to actually be able to measure strain as well with these, these fiber optic cables um, so that we could see differential strain, how operations or, or how um, the different units may respond um, uh, to, to perturbations in pressure or, 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 or temperature. Um, so that can give us some insights into, um, into how the subsurface can respond. We can then put those into models to, to think about what would be in terms of risk and, and hazard associated with um, uh, creating or avoiding uh, seismicity. Okay. Th thanks. So maybe we have some uh, another question or two. I, I see Professor George here, which he's also been very interested in what we've been doing for at least 10 or more years. <laughs> so uh, do you have anything, Al, you might want to add to this or question? Uh, I have a question, Sorry. actually. Okay, oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Ron. Go ahead, Ron. Go ahead, Ron. Um, so I was wondering for the stuff you kind of talked about in the first part of the talk where you're trying to figure out like how hot the fault gets. Um, it seems like you need to solve the heat equation like backwards in time when you do that, right? So uh, my understanding was that's like an ill posed problem. So you can, can you talk about how that sort of affects how accurately you're able to estimate the heat? The heat? Sure. Good, good question. That's a, right. that's a great question. And so, um, so maybe I can uh, see if I can jump back. So essentially, uh, and that comes to kind of our inversion. So we're essentially, you're right, we're solving for the heat equation backwards. We're kind of using diffusion and um, trying to go back to try to figure out how much heat is on there. You asked the question about how hot did it get on the fault itself. That is ill-posed. We don't know. Diffusion kind of smears things out. So what we can constrain is how much total energy was on this thing. We don't know whether that all that energy was deposited in a one millimeter size fault or a one centimeter or a 10 centimeter or a one meter size fault. If all that heat was deposited or in that sh maybe the slip all 50 meters happened within a shear zone that was two meters wide, that heat is distributed and the peak temperature in the fault may only get up to you know, 100 degrees or something. But if that all that slip happens and all that heat is deposited within uh, like a millimeter or a centimeter, well, then the temperature could rise up to uh, a thousand of degrees, but then it very quickly um, uh, uh, dies off. Um, so this comes to geology to constrain. Them. So for these models, they are independent uh, of the, the, the actual, the, the results are independent of what actual the, the, the size of the fault was or what the peak temperature was. The one thing, regardless of those things we can constrain is the total heat energy. And that's what we really want to know because that can then get us to stress and friction coefficient. Okay, I see. I have a related question. So yeah, do we, do you have, I, I've been not being a geologist, but not understanding, you know, fluids and slip and things. So yeah. do you have evidence of, from the drilling, from the structure of what comes up when you go across the fault, how, how thick it was melted? That's the first question I have. With. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's what I was starting to get into, but held back on. Um, and so the thing is from the drilling itself, we know actually by coring, we kind of take like a biopsy of the, the fault yeah. um, or the equivalent. And we see that the fault is actually less than 2.4 meters, we can, can, meters thick. So the inside that there's lots and lots of little failure planes and stuff like that on it. We, you know, there's been, you know, tens of thousands of years of, of, of accumulated slip on this fault um, or on that plane. We don't know which one of those planes actually occurred on this one, but we can analyze that and we could see if any of it is um, melted or uh, chemically changed. And that's where I do a lot of other work is um, working with geochemists and, and geologists to kind of do the modeling, the thermal modeling for these things um, to try to think about um, what do we see and what don't we see? If we see something, what does that mean in terms of if you do the chemical kinetics that relates to a certain temperature, time history, what would that mean in terms of slip and things like that? Um, okay. so, so in this okay. case, we did not see melted rock, but we saw lots of slip zones that were on the order of centimeter to millimeter scale. So I have another question. It's, I'm, I'm pretty sure it must have been done by somebody already. But if you say during slip, you have a, 
you know, during the, during an earthquake, you have a certain effective friction coefficient along with yeah. the break, so to speak, which changes yeah. from where it was beforehand. Then you could, do people look at the, the solid, the waves in the solids on the two sides and the speed they move and what, what happens when they meet to the point that's not split yet? Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, there is a, a propagation thing. And so actually where these things, these kind of measurements kind of agree with other things. So generally seismologists will use the radiated energy. The, so all the, the seismic waves that come through to tell you something about the radiated energy from the earthquake, which tells you something about the stress change. Um, but then in models, and so especially for this earthquake, especially that effect of there being kind of a free surface in a shallow fault zone, some of the kind of weakening of the, this fault may be related to kind of the waves kind of bouncing across that fault surface and kind of not just affecting the shear part, but kind of unclamping, changing the normal stress uh, during. Uh, yeah, this, that's what I was wondering about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This is a fascinating talk. Yeah. Uh, well, it's good. It's going to be an interesting time here at Cornell during the fall, especially when we're installing all this stuff. So you'll get a chance if you're, if you have time to, uh, to, you know, certainly see how this fiber optic cable is put in and, and cemented and uh, the kind of data we get out of it. So it's a great opportunity for us as a university right now. So, and uh, we're glad we have Patrick here to help us with this, right? Yeah, and, <laughs> okay. and you have, and the fiber optics gives you continuous measurements. Right, right, so right yeah. Log it, and log yeah, it, and drag it out again. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, exactly, continuous exactly. Continuous measurements at, de at all different depths and as a function of time. So it's, you yeah. build up huge amounts of data. Yeah. So do you multiplex the data on one, one fiber optic or the many of them? Multiple. multiple. <laughs> Okay, it's a bundle. Yeah. yeah, I think there's more than one op, uh, fiber in there. That's for sure, right? But, right. But I mean, is it, is it is it one measurement per fiber, or are they do they somehow? No. Yeah. Well, so I think one in one particular type of measurement. So if you have one fiber, you can do temperature. And so, um, so what the thing is is you shoot a laser, you measure the Raman backscatter on it, through it, and so you measure. Um, a particular part of the backscatter can give you temperature. Another part gives you strain, which you can use for acoustics and such. Okay. So you usually have two separate interrogators for that. But with that one cable, because the backscatter is coming back at different times, you get a measurement from that one shot with the laser, which is happening every second, pretty much. You get a measurement at every 20 centimeters along right. that fiber. Yeah. It's, <laughs> okay. it's pretty cool, right? Right, yeah, that's for is. sure. <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, maybe we hey, should. Uh, yeah, I have we to should, sign off. Really yeah, maybe we should call it quits for today. But thank you guys for hanging in there, and uh, thanks a lot, Patrick, for for doing this. So yeah, thanks for your patience. Sorry for going a little or a long. I well, there's a lot of stuff you you know when you're well, talking about something you love doing. There's a tendency to show us a lot, <laughs> and there is a lot. <laughs> That's yeah, a good yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Take care now. We'll Thank see you later. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay, thanks all.